Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Friday Night Live. I'm so glad you're here. You know, I want to let you know that I look forward to these so much. I hope you like them half as much as I do, because for me, it's the best way to spend my Friday night. So I'm so glad you're here. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sue. Hi, Mindy. Hi, Elsa. Nice that you're here. Hi, Anne. Shirley, watching here in Pittsburgh. What's the weather like in Pittsburgh right now? I'm kind of curious about that. I live in the Lake Tahoe area. I'm actually on the backside of Mount Rose down at the bottom of the mountain. And we had snow here on Monday. It was wild. We had a freak snowstorm in the middle of October. So that was a lot of fun. I just want to tell you guys that when I am done with my lives, I go back through and I read every single one of the chats. It's so much fun for me to have you guys come here and I love to hear what you have to say. So chat away. I love to go through it. Um, hello from Ontario, um, Canada, watching from Texas. Hello from Oregon, Montreal, Linda in Montreal. Hi, everyone. So we're going to have a cat attack <laughs> here tonight because my cat is right down here and he wants me to play with him. So he's probably going to be a bit of a fussy mess tonight. Um, welcome in. If you're new here, I'm Kimberly. This is Pretty Over 50, where we talk everything makeup, skincare, and style for the over 50 woman. Tonight, we're talking about solo travel tips, and I am sharing my tips that I've learned from three different types of trips. A road trip, a trip where I just took off and went and stayed somewhere for two months, and then a two years of full-time travel where I'd sold everything, my house, my car, all my stuff, left the country with everything I owned, which was a carry-on suitcase and a backpack, and I was gone for two years. So the the reason I want to talk about each one of those trips is that I learned different things from each one of them. And I got some tips that I think are handy if you're thinking about traveling. And I can save you a little bit of fuss and trying to figure things out by just sharing what really, really worked for me. Um, before we get started, oh, this is one thing I want to share with you guys. If you're not signed up to my beauty newsletter that I send out every Sunday, I send out a little email newsletter every Sunday, and it's not real wordy. It's just seven little things that I've uncovered during the week or I want to share with you guys that I think are worth seeing, mentioning, or checking out. You might want to go ahead and sign up now if you're not already because I'm already having a ton of companies contact me about Black Friday Cyber Monday sales and that sort of thing. So I know that the industry is going to go big about sales and that sort of thing. So if there's things that you're wanting that you've got your eye on, you're waiting for a better price, I will put those. I will, I'll be putting those in the beauty newsletter. So you can sign up down below in the description box. It just says beauty newsletter, and then there's a little link you click on, and you just put in your name and your email address, and that comes out every Sunday morning, before, right when I post my Sunday morning video. You can unsubscribe at any time. It's completely free. It's just super handy. And I think as we roll into the holiday season, I'll be sharing a lot of the specials and a lot of the sales. Sometimes manufacturers will contact me when, and it looks to me like they've done a spur of the moment sale for the weekend. In other words, they'll say, hey, we're just announcing this. It's good Thursday through Sunday night. And those are handy things for you guys to know if you've got your eye on something, I can give you a way to get it a little bit less expensive. So those are always fun. Um, hello from Ohio, North, Northern Virginia, Toronto, Ontario. This is so fun. I love these. I hope you guys like them as much as I do. I would do this every Friday night, but then you would guys would think I had no social life. And who wants that, right? Um, another, uh, Carol, oh, is Mel C here? Oh, Mel C's Makeup and Styles. She's got a great channel. Um, I love it when she shows up for the lives. If you're not subscribed to her, go subscribe to her. She's really a lot of fun. She's in, she's in Canada. Um, Illinois, Kentucky, fun. Nice. Okay, give me a five by five, everyone, or a thumbs up if you can hear me okay and see me okay and if, if the lighting's good and that sort of thing. And once I hear from you guys that we're all good, then I'll go ahead and launch in. I do have um, some questions on were submitted and I'll try to kind of a little bit about my travel tips and then go to a couple of questions and then talk back about another travel tip. Thank you, Leah. Appreciate it. Thank you, Muff. Thank you, Mel. 
Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Anne. All righty. Well, the first trip that I want to talk about or the tips that I want to share is the road trip that I just got back from just a few weeks ago. As you know, I live in the Lake Tahoe area. We had really crazy fires this year. It was smoky, so smoky you couldn't go outside for almost two months. <laughs> and I finally snapped and I decided, you know, I'm getting out of here. I'm going on a road trip. And I decided that I wanted to go to Florida because I'd been hearing a lot about Florida. And to be honest with you, I'm kind of mildly thinking about moving to Florida, but I thought it would be a fun trip to go do Florida. So that's what I did. So I'm going to share with you the tips and tricks that I learned that made the trip easier for me and safer for me and what I did to make sure that it just went really smoothly. And the one thing I can say to you, if you're thinking about solo traveling, is that I have now traveled quite a bit by myself. I've traveled a lot with other people, but I've traveled a lot by myself as well. And here are the things that I can share. I have not had anything happen to me that I would say was a bad experience from traveling. I've never had any issues. I've never had any, you know, anything like that, any thefts or you know, just bad experiences. It's all been good. The only times that I've had bad experiences traveling was going to San Francisco. For some reason, San Francisco and I just don't get along. I've had my wallet stolen there. I've had my car broken into. But other than that, every place I've traveled has been wonderful. And if you're thinking about doing it, but you're a little scared, just go do it. You'll be surprised at how enriching and how fun it is and how much you learn about yourself. And here's the thing with traveling, you're never alone because there's people everywhere you go. You'll run into people, you'll meet people, you'll talk to the waitress at the restaurant you're eating at or at the farmer's market you're visiting or that sort of thing. So it really is not that you're alone the whole time. There's lots of people every place that I go. So I had decided to take this trip to Florida and I knew it was going to be a long drive, which it was. The cool thing about taking a car is that you can pack a lot more stuff. So I was able to pack whatever I wanted and not worry about it because I took, I took my bigger vehicle and there's plenty of room in there. And the things that I took that I take on every single trip, and you guys, if you follow my channel, you might have heard about these already. First of all, I always, always, always travel with a money belt. And the reason that I travel with a money belt, and I've got it right here, I've got some show and tell, is because I travel with a significant amount of cash. And why do I travel with cash? Because I never know what's gonna happen, and we never know what's gonna happen. And I know that if I have cash with me, that that's gonna open a lot of doors if I'm in a bind or if I'm in a pickle, and I've got cash. So I keep my cash, in my money belt, and I also keep my passport in my money belt, even if I'm traveling stateside. The reason I do this is because if I lose my driver's license, I don't have to worry about it. I've got a second form of ID. So I keep my money belt here with my cash in it, and this money belt stays with me all the time. And if I'm in the hotel room, I've got it within eyesight. So the, the reason that I carry so much cash is that if I get in an accident, my car is not drivable, I've got cash that I could even go out and buy an inexpensive car. What if all the rental cars are, are sold out? What if the banks are shut down? What if, what if, what if, if? I don't wanna have to bump up against that problem. What if I lose my debit card? What if, what if? So I make sure that I have plenty of cash with me and it's always just nice to have that cushion. So this money belt stays on my body all the time. And when I'm driving, I just flip it around to the front so I don't have to lay against it. <laughs> and it's really, it's really almost invisible underneath your shirt. You don't have to worry about that. So definitely this is one thing that I travel with. The second thing I travel with is my backpack. And this looks like a standard backpack, but it's not. This is from a company called PackSafe. And the difference with this backpack is that it has anti-theft wiring throughout it. So if you lock this backpack up to something really super heavy in your hotel room or your Airbnb, like a bed, 
nobody's going to be able to get in it. I mean, it's really, really going to be tough. And what you do is you just lock up the little zippers here, just like you would anything else, like if you're locking up a bike. And you can put valuables in here, like my laptop, or if I had a camera or something like that, I've got this backpack right here, and I can lock my valuables up in the room. And this thing is a pain to get into. I haven't had anybody break into any place that I've ever stayed, but if they did, they would have a tough time getting into this. This company, PackSafe, they specialize in this type of travel equipment. So if you're thinking about traveling and you want a, a crossbody bag that's going to have a strap that's hard to cut, or if you want a wallet that has, you know, anti-theft to it, you can get it from this company. I've had this backpack, gosh, now for probably eight or nine years. It's still brand new. Nothing about it has broken or frayed or got any sense of wear to it all. It still looks brand new. So I can really, really um, recommend this. I don't have links to these in the description box yet, but I'll go ahead and do that tonight. So if you want to come back tomorrow morning and I can link the ones that I got so you can check them out, that might be handy for you. So those are the two things that I travel with all the time. Now, when I took my car trip to Florida, I was able to take things like my French coffee press. <laughs> I travel with my own coffee press and my own coffee because, you know, we all know what hotel coffee is like. So I'm able to make my own coffee in the Airbnb or the hotel room. And I took this time an insulated bag. It almost looks like a satchel or a shoulder bag. It was an insulated bag. And that's where I kept everything that had to do with food or kitchen items. So I'll often go to a farmer's market or to the organic section of a grocery store and get fruit and that sort of thing to travel with me. And that's what I keep and put into that little bag and I carry one of those little you know those little frozen things that you stick in the freezer they're for camping and stuff and they're just like a frozen packet I'll put it in those bags and that travels with me and someone had put a question on um they had submitted a question how do I keep things that like lipstick and that sort of thing that is heat sensitive I just throw anything that's heat sensitive into that travel bag or that insulated carrier and that goes into the hotel room with me at night and then comes back into the car the next day. So those are the two things that I carry with me that help keep my belongings safe. Here's another trick that I encourage you all to do, particularly if you're traveling somewhere out of town, is I always carry a crossbody bag and so a shoulder bag. And I always make sure that I have that strap around my neck so that if I'm in a gas station and someone looks at me as an easy target and wants to grab my purse, they're not going to be able to get it off my body because it's hooked around my neck. So the minute I get out of my vehicle and I have my purse with me, that goes right over my head and I keep that tucked right next to my body. I am... I am very, very aware at every moment when I am in an, in an unfamiliar city or I'm traveling about where my possessions are, where my car keys are, where I park, everything. Because it's really easy to be in a new place and to be disoriented or just being distracted by all these new things and forget about taking care of your possessions. And that is at the top of my list. <laughs> Okay, the next thing that I want to talk about is where I keep my driver's license and my debit card. And you guys can't judge me for this. This is really, <laughs> this is the way I do it. And maybe you do too, or maybe your great aunt does it too. When I am out, and usually, almost always, even when I'm out around town, you guys are going to laugh. I keep my debit card and my driver's license together, and I tuck them in my bra right in the side of my bra and it, it's always on this side there why do i do this well it's a trick that i learned when i was traveling out of the country full time if i'm sleeping on a bus or sleeping on a train and even if i have my purse around my neck or if i'm holding onto my backpack someone could maybe unzip something or get their hands into my position 
possessions and take the things that are most important to me, my, my identification and my debit card. But they're not going to get into my bra and I'm not going to notice it. So I always keep my driver's license and my debit card tucked in my side all the time. Why do I always do it on this side? Because that way I always know where it is. It's always there. I, the minute that I am done using it, right back it goes into my, into my little safety deposit. Here's the cat right back here. Okay, come on, guy. All right, you guys, here's... Here's the troublemaker right here. Okay. So that's how I keep, you know, my debit card and my driver's license safe. And I do this all the time. That, um, that alone is really helpful. Now, when I am traveling and driving and I'm getting out to go for the day, I always make a note to myself about where I'm going to keep my keys. And the reason I want to do that is because the last thing I want to do when I'm traveling on the road is lose my keys or misplace them. And so when I leave in the morning, I make a mental note, my keys are going to go here or my keys are going to go here. I'll pick a place. If I'm wearing yoga pants that have a pocket in them, I'll decide the keys are always going to be in the right-hand side pocket of my yoga pants. So when I stop at a gas station to get gas, which is something you have to do a lot when you're on a road trip, I my keys automatically go right in there and I'll double check them from time to time to make sure that I've got them right there. So if I'm going to go inside to use the restroom, I'll check my keys. I'll check my debit card. I'll make sure that my purse is across my body and that way that I keep everything really, really safe. And I think that this attention to detail like that has really helped me not have any bad experiences. It's those little things that I know are repetitive, like where am I going to put my keys? Where am I going to put my identification and my debit card? If I know exactly where those are going to go, then I can enjoy what I'm doing and not worry about the little things. So those are that's how I keep my daily things safe. The next thing that I can tell you, and I learned this from experience, is when you're traveling on a road trip, if you're traveling by yourself or with a girlfriend or with your husband or whatever, these are the two things that I did on my trip. First of all, I never let the gas on my car get less than half full. See, that is a cat foot right there. That's what that is. <laughs> Excuse me, you guys, I gotta get him down. Come on, sweetie. There we go. So I never let my car get less than half full. So the minute it hit that halfway mark, I'm stopping in a gas station and get gas. Why? Because I don't know if there's going to be an accident down the road. And I'm going to end up having to sit in traffic for an hour and run my fuel down. I don't know if I'm going to get to a stretch of freeway where there's not going to be any gas stations. I just don't know. And that half full gas tank gives me a whole lot of leeway about unexpected occurrences on the road. So as soon as my gas was half down, boy, I'm stopping and filling it right back up. The thing is, is that then, of course, you're stopping a lot more for gas. And I actually didn't mind because that way I got out to walk around a little bit. And I never had that uncomfortable feeling of, oh, my gosh, I'm less than a quarter of a tank. It's I don't know where the next gas station is going to be. And if I'm going to be able to get there in time, the last thing I want to do is run out of gas. So absolutely the gas half full, gas tank half full. The next thing is, and, and we're all women here. I'm assuming we're all women. My cat is cute. Thank you very much. He's cute, but he's a pain in the butt sometimes. He's over here wrestling with the backpack. One thing I've learned, ladies, and particularly at my age, I go to the, I stop to use the restroom right when I think I might need to. Because I've gotten in a few stretches of road that I thought, oh, I'll just wait a little bit. Oh my gosh, not a good idea. I, it's the minute I think that I need to use the restroom, by golly, I stop and use the restroom. Now, I'm not averse to pulling off the side of the road and kind of doing the, you know, the whole camping thing kind of restroom trip, but I don't want to do that if I don't have to. So definitely, if you're traveling by road, stop the minute you think that you need to. Um, let's see, have you taken a self-defense class? You know, I did take self-defense a long time ago. I wouldn't say that I, I'm proficient at it, and I have never gotten in a situation 
where I felt like I needed it. I don't drive at night when I'm on the road at all. I don't get on the road before the sun comes up and I am off the road long before the sun goes down because I don't want to be driving around at night in an area that I don't know. So I am very, very careful about that. Um, <laughs> you need to produce a, bar, a bra with a secret compartment for license and debit card. I'm sure there's a market for this. I know that's kind of a good idea. I think you ought to do that, Leah. That would be great. Have you ever checked out a stash bag? No, but I'm going to do that now. Thank you. Okay. We all know the consequences of waiting too long to go to the restroom. I know that I hate that feeling. And so stop before you even think you have to go. Someone sent in a question and asked me if I plan my lodging beforehand. For this particular trip, I did not most of the time because when, particularly when I was driving, the way that I planned my trip, I was pretty flexible with myself. I wasn't sure where I was gonna end up at the end of the day. So I didn't. But one thing I did learn on this trip, and I, by golly, I am so glad to have this piece of information, <laughs> at least this is what worked for me. The Holiday Inns, whether it's a Holiday Inn, a regular one, or the Holiday Inn Express, the best beds. Absolutely the best beds. And I pretty soon I got to the place where I thought that's all the only place I'm going to stay is at the Holiday Inns. And as you're doing a car trip, you get used to the fact that there's going to be a whole plethora of those kind of overnight hotels before you get into a big city, in a big city, and then after you get out of a big city. So there's going to be at least three along the main route going through that, that city. And one thing I can tell you is, and I made this mistake on the trip one night, stop before you think you're ready for the day. I was driving like seven, eight, nine hours a day. And I mean driving. When you're driving, you can drive for seven hours, but you're on the road for nine because you've stopped, you've stopped to eat, you've stopped to use the restroom and get gas and that sort of thing. So you may be out for nine hours and you've driven seven hours. I got into a situation when I was gone on the trip where I didn't stop before I was ready. And I ended up, it was dark. It was, it had gotten dark. I was in an area and I ended up getting a room that was pretty sketchy. I'm pretty sure they were doing drug deals outside my room. I mean, because, and it was my mistake because I had gotten so tired and I'd had to double back and I was just feeling a little exhausted and frustrated. I ended up getting a room. It wasn't a holiday inn. It was another chain and I I didn't check it out like on hotels.com to get the reviews. I didn't take the time to review it. And everything worked out fine. You know, it's like I didn't like being there. It wasn't a fun experience. Nothing bad happened. But you know what? I did it to myself because I didn't stop early enough and I didn't have time to check it out. And I now I always go to a holiday inn. So stop before you're ready because boy by golly one once it gets dark and you're tired and exhausted, it's just no fun to end up in the kind of place that I ended up in. So that's how um, that's how I learned that lesson, and I know that for sure now. Um, let's see. There is a snap on credit card size fabric type holder. It probably is an Amazon. Snaps on your bra and holds your ID and debit card. Yeah, you know what I like about keeping it in that area. Golly, even if I'm sound asleep, I'm going to notice if someone's getting near there. So I hope that tip helps you a lot. All right. So now um, I've traveled, I've driven, I've learned to stop gas tank half full, go to the bathroom before you think you need to, stop before you think you're ready. I had such a good time on this trip. And the cool thing was being able to see all the cultures and all the changes in geography along the way in just the different ways that people are I'll tell you the men you ladies that live in the south I am not kidding you your men are so polite I had the door held open for me by more men in the south in that little trip than I've had for the last 20 years on the west coast your men are so polite it was just so lovely 
And I really noticed a difference in the culture from the different state to state to state. Okay, I'm gonna answer just a couple of questions now. And if you guys have any questions, go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll, I'll try to fit them in right there. Um, okay, so the first one, um, Isabel Rivera. Thank you, Isabel. If you travel alone, what do you take for protection? The answer is uh, nothing, just my wits. I don't travel with a weapon or a firearm. I, you know, it's like I have thought about getting a firearm in the past, but you know what? I'm the type of person I end up shooting my toe off or something. I'm probably just not the best candidate to own a firearm. I know it's probably a smart thing to do, and maybe at some point I'll take a class and up my skill level. I have shot firearms in the past, but I don't know. I think that I'd be kind of one of those people that would, you know, get in trouble with it. I don't travel with anything other than my phone, which I think is a good protection mechanism because I could take a picture of someone who's trying to accost me, and I also can dial 911. Um, this is uh, from Miss Miss Bear, and she says, would love to know your tips on traveling safely and getting good deals when solo without the need for group adventuring. Also, pointers for when you do feel like mingling while traveling solo. You know, that's a really, really good question because, you know, sometimes it's just fun to hang around with other people and do something as a group. Generally, when I'm traveling, I do things on my own, like kayak or hike or that sort of thing. But every now and again, I will hook up onto a trip group kind of thing. And every time I do, I have such a blast. It's so much fun. I learn something new. Um, I have a good time. It's always totally worth it financially. And I don't know why I don't do it often. I just That's just a curious thing about me. But one of the things I would do if you were traveling, particularly in the States, and you wanted to hook up with some people in the local area is I would hop onto the local meetup group and see if there's a hiking club or any kind of club that does the type of acti activity that you're interested in that has an event in the next day or two. I actually have a hiking meetup group here where I live. You guys have heard me talking about my hiking club. And from time to time, we get people that are just in town for a little bit that just wanna get out, meet some other people, do something in a group and they'll show up for one of our events. And I'm always really thrilled when they do. So that's something to think about. Not only can you take group trips when you're going to destinations or parks or that side of things, but you can check out the meetup groups locally to see if there's something fun there as well. Um, pepper spray for protection. You know, that's probably a really, really good idea. Christine, I think that that's probably something I'll add to my arsenal. I used to have pepper spray a long time ago. I don't know what I did with it, but I don't have it anymore. But that's probably a very, very good tip. I do think that making sure that I am not out after dark, that i am it's always light where I am, and I pretty much stay on main roads and go to main, main gas stations, that sort of thing. I think that's been helpful for keeping me out of harm's way. All right, next question is, oh, okay, this is an interesting one. It's a little bit of a touchy subject, so I'll try to be as politically correct as possible. This is from Kelly Barnes, and she asked, I'm not sure if you're willing to answer that, but has your vaccination status affected any of your traveling? The answer is no. Um, that was really interesting for me to see the difference in the perception or the culture around that whole thing from the West Coast all the way to the East Coast. And it was really, really quite different. Interestingly enough, um, it was much stricter as far as um, mass and that sort of thing on the West Coast. Once I left California, uh, there was just nothing. I mean, people were just living their lives. So I just, I thought that was kind of interesting. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bounce um, in right now and talk, talk with you guys about a trip I took to Florence for two months, and I did this a few years back, and I am not kidding you one little bit. I spent two months in Florence for under $3,000 for the whole trip. That included airfare, everything. And I'll tell you exactly how I did that, which is really kind of a fun full story. I was living up at the lake, up at Lake Tahoe, right, right on the lake, right near the lake. And it snows up there a lot. And it was, I had a great 
Thanksgiving there. I had a great Christmas there. And then all the partying was over and the fun was over. Then it comes to January. So January, February, March, and a little bit of April. And I thought, you know what? I can only snowshoe so much. And I don't know if I want to spend the next three months in the snow. So I decided that I would go on a trip. Now, keep in mind, you guys, I, I have always worked. I have always worked. I am not independently wealthy. I've always worked, and I've always worked for myself. And since the internet really got fully functional, I have worked for myself and been able to work for myself from home. So when I say I do, I'm doing all this traveling, it's not that I'm rich and I can just take off anywhere. I always work when I travel. It's just that I work wherever it is I'm going. So I was living um, up at Lake Tahoe. This is when I had the design and illustration business. And I was an agent for myself and for other artists. And it was all online. My clients didn't know if I was in California or if I was in Singapore. I mean, all they got from me was an email. They had no idea where I was. So I decided to go somewhere for a couple of months to get out of the snow. And where I decided to go was Florence. I had gone to school in in Italy for a while when I was in college. I love Italy. I thought this would be a great thing. And I wanted to go for a couple of months because I wanted to spend time there to really get to know Florence. So what I did, this was way back when, when Airbnb was first just starting to get some traction. What I did is that I went on to Airbnb and I knew that January, February, and March in Florence was low season for tourist season. In other words, they're not getting the summer tourist flood that they get in those months. So I went on to Airbnb and I, I, I identified three or four places, I'm pretty sure, that looked good to me, that were really close to, close to the Duomo. They had the kind of you know accommodations that I was looking for. And I emailed all three or all four of those people. I said, hey, I want to come to Florence for a couple of months. I can rent your place for two months. What kind of deal can you make me? So I offered a number. I can't remember if I offered a number or if I just what kind of deal you can make me. Well, long story short is that one of the, the landlords got back to me and he offered me an apartment in Florence, literally, literally half a block from the Duomo. It was a beautiful apartment, a huge bathroom, a full kitchen, to a, a sleeping loft, and then a sofa with a pull-out bed. Just beautiful in an old um, in an old house that had been converted into different apartments, you know, like they do, for eight hundred dollars a month. So I was able to stay in Florence for two months for $800 a month, and that included utilities. Then I started flight shopping, and I was able to get a flight from San Francisco to Florence. I had to make, I think I had to make two connections for it was like $400 because it was low season. So I was able to get to Florence for very, very inexpensively, and I had a great place to stay for very, very reasonably. So what I did was that I simply just picked up my life and I moved it to Florence. So I, I did my same routine in Florence that I did when I was up at the lake. I just got up in the morning, had my coffee, I worked for a little bit, and then I would spend the rest of my day just touring Florence. I shopped in the Mercados, which are the, they're different. They're, they don't have big grocery stores like we do here. It's more small little markets that are very specialized. And then they have what are called mercados, which is where they sell the fruits and vegetables and the meats and the pastas and that sort of thing. So I just went and did my shopping just like the locals do, cooked in my apartment in the evening. Sometimes I would go out for lunch and was able to have a great trip in Florence for under $3,000, which I think is a pretty good experience. Now that under $3,000 number includes my, my lodging costs because I kept my place here in the States and my airfare. I didn't include my food because I would have eaten at home. And I didn't include things like museum admissions and that sort of thing because I would have spent that kind of money at home going to different things for entertainment. 
So it was, you know, under three, under three thousand dollars for the two months. And that was just expenses that I incurred that were on top of what I would have spent at home. So I had a great time in Florence. And here's here's one trick that worked really well for me is I was able to hook up with people in Florence through friends and through Facebook groups. One thing you may not know is that on Facebook, and probably Facebook's probably a little less popular now than it was back then, but there are expats groups. Sorry, cat again. Come on, sweetie. Look out. Um, there are face there are expat Facebook groups for almost anywhere you want to go in the world. And what I did is I hopped onto Facebook and I joined the expat groups for Florence, Italy. And you'll find out what people are doing, what the restaurants are to go to, where the places are to stay, everything. They're very generous. They're very excited, you know, to share what they've learned with new people. And also you can join in on what they're doing. And I made friends through the Facebook groups and then was able to connect with people in town to do things with. And also if I had a question like, um, where, you know, I need to get this medication, where would I go to get it? People would answer those questions. So it wasn't as though I was there alone by myself without any resources. I had that Facebook group with people that were really willing to help out and, you know, and, you know, connect. So that was a lot of fun. Um, my cat just photobombed me. I know he's, <laughs> you know, what is it about orange tabbies? Don, I don't know what it is. My cat's name is Dex, and I swear, this cat is busy all the time. I I have expect to come home someday and find him with a wrench having dismantled the dishwasher. I mean, that's what he's like. He's into everything all the time. So, alrighty, let's go to a couple of questions, and then I'll talk a little bit more about my trip to Florence, and then I'll tell you guys how I traveled for two years and what I learned with the tips and tricks there. So this is from Joanne Dance. She says, I'm from England and I'm addicted to your dips and tricks. Thank you very much. Um, makeup and lifestyle at approaching 50. Wanting to travel more, what one thing can you not live without? Probably the first two things I talked about, the money belt and the backpack. Um, when I went to Florence, I was there for two months and all I took with me was a carry-on suitcase and that backpack. And that was it. That's all I had. So all my clothes were in my carry-on suitcase, and it was really small. I think I might have shared it with you guys way back at the beginning of my channel. This suitcase is so cool. I still have it. I still use it. It's what I took on my trip with me this month. It's one of those hard-sided metal suitcases, and it's on rollers. And I packed, and it's but it's small, you guys. It's like it can go in an overhead compartment. I packed all my clothes for two months in that. And you know what? I had more clothes than I needed to wear. <laughs> One thing that I did is because it was winter time in Florence and winter in Florence might be cold for the Italians, but it wasn't cold for me. I'm telling you, they were in these huge puffy jackets and I'm like sweating. <laughs> winter there is like 50s, 60s and a little bit drizzly and rainy, but never, it was very rarely rainy enough that I didn't feel like I could go out and walk around. One of the things that I was really glad I took is I took some really comfortable knee-high boots with flat that did not have a heel. Sweetie, come on, get down. He's right in the middle of everything. Um, and I wore those on the, tr on the plane because they're bigger. I wore those on the plane and some, you know, really comfortable stuff. Another thing that I wore on the plane that was so handy is I had a big black shawl and it was a wool blend shawl. And that thing was so great to travel with because not only could I wrap it around me and use it as a fashion element, it acted as my blanket on the plane. And I took that thing through my whole trip to Italy and it was so very, very handy because it just adds a sense of elegance to any outfit to have a black shawl. So I wore my black boots on the, on the plane and I wore my black shawl. That thing truly came in so very, very handy. All right, so, um, you know, I did take my cell phone with me 
And what I did when I got to Florence is I just went to a cell phone store and they changed out the SIM card so that I got the local cell phone service. So that was just completely seamless. What I did, however, that was when I was in Florence. That was before there was all the technology that we have now. When I travel full time out of the country, I have a service called Google Fi. So my service is not Verizon, it's not AT&T. It's a service offered through Google. And the, the deal that Google has made with different companies is that I can literally go anywhere with my phone and it automatically changes carriers. So Google has contracted with all these carriers around the globe so that when I land, like when I landed into Ecuador, my phone said, hi, welcome to Ecuador. <laughs> you know, your phone's working. So that's one of the things. And the Google Fi service is so inexpensive. I think I maybe pay, gosh, right now, 30 or $40 a month for my phone. It's so affordable. But if you're traveling, I can highly recommend it because regardless of where I travel to, I always had self service and I didn't have to change out a SIM card or do any kind of, you know, machinations like that. Um, hi, Mindy. Hi, Christine. Um, expat. So expatriate groups for Facebook. And that's going to come up in really in a big way. How about doing a packing demo? I don't know. I don't think I'm qualified. That's over my pay grade. Um, Capital Salem and Little Point Towns are great. Okay. So we're talking about Oregon. Recently traveled in Oregon and was asked to show proof of vaccination at every restaurant. Oh, Gosh, that probably is interesting. Okay, I'm going to answer a couple of questions here. This is from April Keck. She said, what brand kayak do you have that is easy to unload and load by yourself? I have a Wilderness Systems Tarpon kayak, which is my dream boat. <laughs> I figured it was, I just got it this season. And, you know, I decided to just get the, the boat that I loved the most. Um, and I'm so happy that I did. Is it easy to load and unload by myself? It is for me. It is pretty heavy. It's like 55 pounds. But I have a rack called a Holivator. It's made by Thule. And it's a rack that sits on top, top of your car. And it actually pulls out and down on hydraulics so that it's it ends up being, so my kayak ends up being parallel to the side of my car. And I can just lift it off and either put it on my kayak cart or carry it down to the water. That Holivator wrap has changed my life as far as kayaking goes, and I'll always own one because it makes it possible for me to go out and kayak by myself. I don't need anyone to help me put my boat on top of my car. So if you're interested in learning to kayak or you're interested in a wrap that can really facilitate ease of getting it on and off your car, I highly recommend them. One thing I can say, and I had a girlfriend recently who was – putting a, a holivator on her car, they're really low on inventory, like everything is right now. I've told you guys the supply chains are really sketchy right now. And she had to wait a couple of months for her holivator. So if you're interested in getting one for next season, you might want to go ahead and order it now. REI um, carries them and they'll also install them for you for a really reasonable price. I think it's like $100 to install the holivator on your car, which is pretty reasonable. I paid a lot more for that from another company, and I, I won't do that again. So that's the kind of kayak I own. Um, what with so little luggage room, were you able to bring home souvenirs? You know, I didn't bring any souvenirs um, this trip. Generally, my funny little souvenir is I get cheesy magnets where I go. I have a collection of cheesy magnets from, from decades of traveling. So that, that's kind of my little deal, but I didn't bring any this particular time. Okay, let's see. Oh, this is from Adela Smith. She said, I went to Crystal River High School. I actually kayaked in, in, the town, in Crystal River. So glad you went to see the manatees. I actually kayaked with the manatees in Florida. That was super fun. The best time is November to March. I can imagine that. I'd love to go back. Also wondered if you got to kayak on Rainbow River, which is in Donella, Florida. It's the most beautiful clear water. You are the second person, Adela, that has asked me about that. I didn't get to Donella this time, but I hope to next time. I had such a great time kayaking in Florida, and I was able to rent kayaks both times. And because I am so familiar with kayaking now, I've been doing it almost 10 years, 
it's really easy for me to rent a kayak and know what I'm doing. So I, if you've thought about kayaking before, I would encourage you to get your own and just get really familiar with it. Because if you travel, even if you don't take your boat with you, you'll become so familiar with getting in and out of the boat, how to maneuver the boat, just how to work the boat to make it a really enjoyable day that is absolutely worth it. Um, hey, Vicki, happy weekend for you too. Nice to see you. Okay, I'm going to answer a couple questions and then I'm going to talk with you a little bit about the trip that I took out of the country <laughs> for a long time. Sue asked, did you make wholesale reservations prior to leaving for a destination, figuring to have to get that far during the day or do you drive until you get to a destination? This time I just drove, but again, I just, I cannot stress enough, stop before you think you're ready because, you know, the one time I did get into, a, you know, just a situation that I wish that I hadn't been in was when I drove too long and, you know, didn't take care. That's what it was. I didn't take care of myself. I kept pushing myself and pushing myself out. I can go further and go further instead of taking care of myself and making sure that I was comfortable and I was in a good situation. So love yourself first and then everything falls into place. Okay, so now for the last little trips tips that I can share is I traveled out of the country um, for, for over a year. And actually... I ended up traveling almost over two years because I stayed in Montana when I came back. And there were some things that I learned about that. If you're thinking about traveling out of the country, I realized that, you know, traveling right now is much more complicated than it was when I did it. And um, which I think is unfortunate. You know, I think it's unfortunate and it does kind of really put a little bit of a dent in our freedoms. Um, but if you do decide to go out of the country or travel ends up, you know, opening up and things get a little bit more relaxed, I can share with you the tips that worked for me. Now, when I did this trip, I sold everything because I didn't know if I was coming back to the States. I wasn't sure if I wanted to end up kind of retiring in another country or just living and working in another country. I wasn't sure. And I wasn't really attached to anything that I had here because, you know, the girls were gone at that time. And I just, I hadn't, I didn't feel attached. I had sold my, I had sold my big house. I had a little house. There was nothing that I felt like I, I needed to keep my life happy. So I ended up selling everything down to my car, all my furniture. I gave a lot of furniture to my daughter's. You know, I just got rid of everything and I left the country with a carry on suitcase and the backpack that I showed you and my laptop. Again, I was doing I was still working in the art and illustration product business and I just took off. What I did with this particular trip is I did the same thing I did when I went to Florence is that I got a hold of the landlords from the different Airbnbs I was looking at and I and I made deals. Because when I was when I was staying, I was staying in places for extended periods of time. So the very first place that I went to was Tulum, Mexico, which is on the Caribbean. I don't know if you've been there. It's just like a dream place. Um, Tulum is one of those places that has, you know, the, the powdered sugar, white sand beaches. And it's a little Mexican town, just a village, really, that's right on the water there. It is the kind of place that I think you could probably just go there and retire and just become a beach bum and be happy. And the same thing is, is that with Tulum, there is a huge, and I mean huge expat community in Tulum. So before I even left, I kind of mapped out where I wanted to go because I kind of had a mind towards where would I maybe like to retire or maybe like to settle and live in instead of living in the U.S.? And so Tulum was the first place I went and I started connecting with people. There was several expat Facebook groups for Tulum and I connected with all of them. And it's so funny and I know this is going to sound odd or weird or kind of just different, but I ended up making friends with the people in the Facebook groups before I ever even left the States. So I had people that I connected with and I would ask them questions and they would share their thoughts. Sometimes they ask you to bring things down 
that, that they can't get down there. And it's kind of like a nice thing that you can do for them. They'll either, you know, throw you a couple of dollars for doing it or take you out to lunch. Or it's just, you know, that's a way for them to connect with people from the States and for people from the States that are going there to connect. So by the time I got to Tulum, I knew a boatload of people. And I just got into town and, and contacted and said, I'm here. <laughs> and so we would meet for lunch or, you know, go out to the beach or whatever. So I already had a built-in group of friends before I ever got to Tulum. So one thing I can say is that if you're going to be traveling internationally, you really can create a whole network of people that will make your trip more fun, more rewarding, more helpful. And I'm still friends with all these people today. I have friends from around the globe that were still connected on Facebook. I have places I could go stay in New York. I could have I have a friend up in Canada that I met. I mean, I just have friends all around from connecting with those Facebook groups. And the cool thing is, is that once you get there and you're in a town, you don't know anything, you don't know where to go, you don't know this, you don't know that, they will prep you and tell you where to go, where to buy your groceries, where the parties are, the whole thing. So it just made it a lot more workable and exciting. Plus, I have lifelong friends that I met from around the world. So that was just a really <laughs> cool part of it. Okay, good ankles. Let's see. I'm a Hallbox, a wonderful island, um, and also love Tulum. Tulum is fairly safe because there's, you know, Tulum is just a nice, lovely little village. And the, you know, the community, the Mexican community there is wonderful. And I'm telling you what, oh my gosh, the food. The food is so remarkable in Tulum because they have the all these restaurants where you'll go in and it's mom and grandma have been cooking up all day. And you'll go in and they'll have all these little things that you can choose from. They'll put it on your plate, you sit down and it's maybe $3. <laughs> you know, it's just like almost nothing. And the food is, I still dream about the food in Tulum. It was just delicious. And then you find your little restaurants that you like to go to. And the one thing I can say about Tulum and a lot of the places in Ecuador as well is that it was more economical for me to go out and eat than it was to buy the groceries and eat in. Um, on my particular trip, and I did, I did the Tulum, gosh, I'm trying to think how many years it's been. It's probably been five years now since I did that. It is so much less expensive to live outside of the U.S. than it is to live in the U.S. I mean, it's ridiculous, the difference. I was living on probably between $800 and $1,000 a month, all in, everything, when I was traveling. My rent, my average rent when I was traveling was probably around $400 a month. And that included everything because I stayed in Airbnbs and my groceries, my food costs were maybe, maybe $200 a month, maybe. And I could just go out and eat whenever I wanted. And then, you know, the rest of it was just things that I did, activities that I did. Because think about it. You don't have, you don't have car expenses. You don't have gas. You don't have insurance. You don't have all your, um, your utilities that you have, you don't have the big groceries in the U.S. are so much more expensive. Whenever, wherever I stayed, I always shopped where the local shop. I didn't go to the big grocery stores. I would shop at the Mercados and, you know, just eat like the locals. So because, first of all, that was the better food. And second of all, that was just, I just wanted to experience what they were experiencing. So I was in... Um, Oh my God, I spent $200 a week for groceries. I know it's crazy ridiculous what we spend to live here in the U.S. It really is. And I know that we've become accustomed to it and acclimated to it. But I'll tell you, when I came back from traveling and had to re readjust to the prices in the U.S., it was it was a challenge. So yeah, I, I lived on, if I had a $1,000 a month, that was an expensive month, truly. Because, you know, even if you took a taxi, it was, you know, not that much. Everything is just a lot different in different countries. 
So I stayed in Tulum for about four months. I had a great time. And I knew that I was going to be going to Ecuador next. I went, I went, I stayed in, I lived in a little town called Clinka, Ecuador. And again, I did exactly what I did when I was living in Tulum. I was connecting with people in Cuenca, Ecuador. And I'll tell you, the expat community in Cuenca is enormous. It's really, really big. And a lot of people have left the States and now live in Cuenca. So there's a huge expat community there. So when I ended up getting to Cuenca, Ecuador, which is a darling little town, it is I think it's an UNESCO heritage site in that there are in the downtown area, you can't change any of the buildings. They're all historically architecturally historical buildings and it's beautiful. It's a quaint, beautiful little town with cobblestone streets and little markets. And, Oh, it's just, it's just delightful. And I was actually in Cuenca, I think for six months total. And again, I got an Airbnb. Um, I worked with a gentleman. He had a lot of different units. And I said, you know, I'm going to be there for a long time. Can you swing me a deal? I think my rent was maybe $4.50 a month in Cuenca. And I shopped at the Mercados. I had a ton of expat friends. And one of the things I can tell you is that the social life was so rich and so full. We were doing stuff almost every night. And there was always someone wanting to go out to lunch. There was always someone wanting to go to the concert. There was always someone wanting to go downtown to walk around in the e evenings and have ice cream or something like that. And it was all very, very easy and it felt safe and it was super affordable. One thing, uh, let's see, Isla says, Tulum has grown a lot, but yes, it is more comfortable living in Mexico. Yeah, it is. Do I speak Spanish? You know... <laughs> I should. I've lived in Mexico now. I lived there when I was in high school for two summers. I lived there right before I got married for about almost a year. I was in a little town called Estapa, which is near Zihuatanejo. And then I lived in Tulum and then I went back to San Miguel de Allende. You would think that I would speak Spanish. My Spanish is so terrible. I know enough to order. I know enough to say thank you. I know enough to say how are you doing, that sort of thing. But as far as being fluent, no. One thing I did notice when I was in Ecuador is that a lot of my friends who had committed to living in Cuenca, who were, they had sold everything in the U.S., they weren't going back, they were staying, they took Spanish lessons. And a lot of them took one-on-one -on -one lessons because it's affordable. And, you know, they were becoming very, very fluent. One thing that, that does happen a lot is, particularly when you're in towns outside, you know, where there's a little bit more of activity. There are a lot of people, locals, that would want to just meet with you and you exchange languages with them. In other words, they want to practice their English with you and you can practice your Spanish with them. So that's another helpful thing that you can do. And plus you, you end up meeting people and getting to know the inside scoop. So I was in Cuenca for about six months. I had a great time. And one of the things that I can say that's very, very different when you're outside of the U.S., and this is true for Italy as well, is that it's much more pedestrian than we are here in the States. It, I walked everywhere. As a matter of fact, when I was in Florence for two months, I did not get in a car for two months. Not once. So I, I flew in. I took the train from Rome to Florence. I walked from the train station to my apartment. I walked the whole time I was in Florence. Florence is a very walkable city. It's not even, gosh, it's just a few miles from end to end. You can walk from one end of the, you know, the downtown area to another just in a, you know, a short span of time. I was not in a car. When I was in Tulum and Cuenca and then later back up to Mexico and San Miguel de Allende, I walked everywhere. It was really unusual for me to get in into a car to go anywhere. You know, when you go to meet friends, you just plan on, you add, you tack 20 minutes on to the time you have to be there because you got to walk there. That's just the way it is. And you know what? I think that I probably kept my weight down a lot more because I was walking a lot more than I do than the U.S. We just don't have that kind of pedestrian architecture or city planning that they do 
in other countries. And I think that that's probably something that we could do better at, you know. Okay, let me answer a couple more questions here. You guys are so sweet to join me. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, I answered that question. Okay, I think I answered all the questions here. Do you guys have any questions? And then I'll talk with you a little bit about um, my time in San Miguel de Andy. Were you ever afraid of getting sick or hurt anywhere? That is such a good question. And you know what? I think that was probably a failing on my part in that I just wasn't. I never worried about it. I never worried about getting sick. I never worried about hurting myself. Although I have to say, I didn't take risks. In other words, um, I was careful with my body. I was careful with what I ate. I was very aware of it. But then again, I'm just a healthy person. I've just been blessed with good genetics. But you know what? That is something that I look back on and I don't I don't know now how I wasn't worried about it. You know, because if I were, let's say I would have had an accident and broken my leg, I would have had to have dealt with a medical care system that was outside of my comfort level or what I'm, you know, what I'm used to. So I can say that, no, I didn't. But let me tell you this. This is an experience. And talk about kindness of people that you meet on the road. I, this is a, this is a girl thing. Okay. I ended up with a bladder infection when I was in Tulum and I was really trying to treat it myself. Well, long story short, it didn't work and it moved up into my kidneys and it got to the point, and this was my, my mismanagement. It got to the point that it was so bad, you guys, I was on the bathroom floor and I literally almost couldn't move. That's how much pain I was in. And I didn't know what I was going to do. What I did is I got onto the Facebook group and I said, you guys, I'm in a bad way. Can, can someone tell me a doctor or, or anything? You, you know, I, I don't even know if the message was coherent. Here's what happened. It turns out that a couple of gals that I had met at, at a big luncheon, she, one of them was a doctor and the other one was a nurse. They were a couple. They said, where are you? They drove to my house. They came in, they got me into the car. The doctor did an examination of me. They drove me to the pharmacy. The doctor ordered what I needed and got me the prescription drove me back home, got me into my apartment, made sure that I was set up with my medication and checked in on me the next couple of days. I mean, can you even believe it? I just, and that's Mary Jo and Joe. I'm still friends with them now. They live in New York City. I can go visit them anytime. But that was the power of having made the connection on the Facebook group. But I'm still, I don't know what I would have done without them because the infection had gotten so bad. It was just in a lot of pain. So, you know, that's how I handled it. And I understand that I was extremely fortunate and lucky and that probably, you know, was not something I should count on in the future. But, you know, I think being aware of it. Some people I know buy travelers medical insurance. I never did. Um, I think probably if I was to travel again, I would probably get that. But it does help you when you're in foreign countries and you have some kind of medical condition. Okay, then I want to just finish up with my trip out of the country. I went from Ecuador. I had met a gentleman there, and we became friends. He um, had lived in San Miguel, San Miguel de Allende for like 25 years. He is originally from Texas. He'd been a successful developer. He just decided he was done with the rat race. He moved to San Miguel de Allende. And I met him when I was in Cuenca, Ecuador, and we became friends, and he kind of got me curious about um, going there. So I went from Cuenca to San Miguel de Allende, and I think I was there for almost six months. Had a great time. And again, the same thing. I just met people through the Facebook groups. But because I knew Charles, and he had lived there forever and a day, he introduced me to a lot of gals that became my girlfriends in town there. And that was another experience where I think I paid – Gosh, you guys, I rented this house in San Miguel. It was a two-story house, huge, 
bunch of bedrooms, bunch of bath, you know, bathrooms, patios, everything else for $400 a month. It was crazy, ridiculous. The reason, and San Miguel can be very expensive because it's a tourist destination. The reason that the house was so reasonable is because I wasn't in the tourist area. I was just in the regular community area. So I had a really, really cool house there. I stayed there for quite a number of months, had a great time, amazing food again, met a lot of really good girlfriends and just did the same thing. You know, I'd get up in the morning, I'd work a little bit in the morning, and then I'd spend the rest of the day out hanging around with my friends, going to the Mercados or going to the plaza, listening to music, whatever. It was just, it was a great trip. So those are pretty much um, the travel tips that I have for you. The things that I can say is don't be afraid to negotiate because most people will negotiate with you, particularly if you're going off season to different places. And if you're going to go to Florence, I would highly recommend that you go in January, February and March before Easter. Once Easter hits, it turns into Main Street on Disneyland in Florence. I'm telling you the difference is so substantial in the amount of crowds. And the weather in January, February, and March in Florence is so workable, particularly if you've lived in any kind of weather in the States. Um, it is so worth it, and you get such a great deal. And you get to go in and see everything because there are no crowds there. But I'll tell you, once Easter hits and on through the summer, it's it's crazy, crazy there. So let me see. Oh, thank you, Mel. Mel, I'm so glad you stopped by. Yeah. Okay, everyone. I think that those are my travel tips. I hope it was helpful for you. If you have any other questions, make sure to put them in the comments down below, or you can always email me at prettyover50 at gmail.com. Um, let's see. Christmas is coming. Sign up for my email newsletter list if you want to know about the sales. I'm actually posting a sale this Sunday morning um, for my favorite sunscreen. The company contacted me. They're running us. I think it's a like a special last minute deal. So you can get some really good sunscreen for a great price. So I'm posting that this weekend. Other than that, I just want to thank you so much. You guys make my day when you show up for these. This is the most fun I have on a Friday night. And I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, make it a great evening. Have, have a wonderful weekend. I've got a new video coming on Sunday with a winter try and haul. I think you're going to love it. Other than that, take care. And... Um, I'll see you next time. Bye now.